Hello, everyone, and welcome back to part three of my interview with uh, Mormon, post-Mormon entrepreneur uh, Jeremy Young. In parts one and two, we've talked about his years growing up in the church and his life as an entrepreneur, uh, going from BYU student to multimillionaire in like four or five years, and all the different uh, cool business ventures he's had and what that's been like. And it's super interesting, and it's fun because Jeremy isn't just someone I've interviewed, it's someone that I've known as a friend since the late 90s when Margie and I lived in Seattle. We were in the same ward together, and we knew each other. Um, and so it's just really fun to hear more about Jeremy's story and how he's um, found success as an entrepreneur and failure in his life and uh, how he's bounced back. So we left a teaser at the end of last episode. He talked about the highest of highs and the lowest of lows where you feel like you've lost everything. And I think that's something that many people who experience a faith crisis also experience. And so let's talk about the evolution of your faith. Let's just say while you're in Seattle, because I know that my big faith crisis hit, you know, I was probably a little bit edgy. I don't know if you remember any interactions with me in our ward or not. You can talk about that if that's even relevant. But I know that I hit the full climax of my faith crisis, 2000, 2001, and that lasted to 2004. I'm sure word got around a little bit, maybe it didn't, but I know that at times we would have bumped into each other and I would have been in a full faith crisis mode and I would have seen you as like this bishopric kind of guy who was really into Joseph Smith and I probably don't want to be fully honest and open with Jeremy. And I don't know if I would have tried to feel you out a little bit for if you were open to talking about this stuff or not, but what I know is that you were there mm -hmm parallel while all this was going on for me. That's right. And it wasn't until years and years after we left Microsoft and moved to Logan where you and I reconnected. And right. I think that was when you were in St. George. Okay. But let's talk about your faith journey sure. as uh, in, in Seattle and as an entrepreneur and where that went over time. Okay. Yeah. So I, we made a bunch of money. And so, I mean, we were, we were just feeling high on life. I mean, as you can imagine, three little kids, beautiful wife. We move out to a beautiful home on the golf course in Snoqualmie. I'm driving a Ferrari. I mean, I mean, life is good, right? And and I get called to be Elders Quorum president. And I've always, I've never had big callings in the church up until this point. I've always been the piano guy. Like I've always been the person to lead choirs and play piano and play in primary and put together musical programs. And sometimes in young men, they call me young men. But I get called to be Elsicorn president, and um, I had some time on my hands, and I'm like, you know, I'm really going to take the bull by the horns, and I, I'm going to be the best Elders Quorum president they've ever seen. And I think I was. I mean, I spent a lot of time um, visiting inactives and visiting members, and, um, you know, the bishopric would tell me they'd never seen an Elders Quorum president like me. I got a lot of kudos for it. You know, I spent a lot of lot of my money on helping other people within the ward. Um, you know, I, I, I tried to be the the best elders quorum president I could be. And um, I was at my mother-in-law's house. And my mother-in-law, amazing woman, amazing. She's been incredibly awesome to me and Molly. And she owned a Deseret bookstore at one point. And she has always kind of played on the fringes of Mormonism a little bit. Um, and even though she's, she's very fundamental in her belief, she plays on, on the fringes when it comes to Mormon history. And I'm looking through her personal library and I see these three books by Michael Quinn. And I'd never heard of Michael Quinn, never even seen these books. And it's the magical worldview and the Mormon hierarchy and the origin, uh, origins of power and the hierarchy of power, right? Around what year? Oh, this had to have been in 2002, 2003. Okay, right, right around the time I'm reading Simon yeah. Southerton and Michael Quinn and yeah. Grant Palmer and that kind of stuff. Exactly. Okay. And so I... I thought that I knew everything I needed to know about Mormon history. I, I felt, I mean, I listened to Truman Madsen, right? <laughs> so, and I wanted to be Truman Madsen. I could see myself going to firesides and talking about Joseph Smith and making everybody feel the spirit. And so I thought I knew it all. And I started to leaf through uh, a couple of these books and Nona walks into the room and she grabs them from me and she says, you can't read those. And I'm like, what? She said, yeah, you can't read those. You'll lose your testimony, you know? And so she literally took them from me. And so I... And you're a grown-ass man. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm 30 years old and, you know, feeling pretty good about myself at that point. And I, uh, I went and bought them on Amazon and they show up and I put them in my bathroom and every morning I'm sitting on the toilet and I'm reading, reading these books and my mind is being blown. Like I've, 
I, I, it's hard for me to go back 12 or 13 years and, and know specifically what I was reading, but I mean, just in general, the, the Magical World View book, right? Um, where Joseph's family believed in divining rods and seer stones and Jupiter talismans and parchments with occult symbols and um, how he dressed in black and went on the solstice to go pick up the plates with Emma and um, dog sacrifices and all of these things that I had never heard of before The treasure in my life. digs, right? The treasure the digs. Excavations. And the, yeah, the excavations and the seer stones. And that was just part of that family's worldview, along with a lot of other people, I guess, at the time. But I had never heard anything of that. But like also that. how it was, it was intended to be a way to make money. Right, right. That it was it was kind of like a scam. And, and that, I'm reading this book on counterfeiting now. We'll talk about oh, yeah, it later, yeah. but I, I mean, in another yeah. episode. But it's like trying to make money in the early 1800s in New York when you're poor and uneducated sucks. But if you can convince farmers that there's this huge treasure to be found, because there's all these rumors about like Captain Kidd and exactly. lost treasure, they'll invest thousands of literally hundreds if not thousands of dollars in this big excavation if they think they're going to get fabulously wealthy as a result. Right. And so it was all this con, whether it was intentional or not. The Smith family wasn't just like innocently treasure digging. It was this intentional, massive con to make money. Yeah. And there was never any treasure, but somehow Joseph had the ability to get people to believe that there was. I'm sorry. I'm reading a book. Had to share. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And I was reading this. I'm looking at the footnotes and I, and I couldn't believe what I was reading. I mean, it, it shocked me to the core. I mean, when you first start getting into this, you almost feel something inside of you that's Dirty. almost jolting. Yeah. It's almost like it's almost like an electrical vote going through your body where you just where that cognitive distance hits so hard <laughs> that you cannot believe what you're reading. And so I looked through the footnotes and I started to do research on the footnotes and, okay, is this true? Am I really reading this correctly? And then the hierarchy books, again, I mean, one of the things I distinctly remember is how the, uh, the revelation on the blacks and the priesthood came about. I mean, it, it wasn't a revelation. It was literally enough of the racist prophets and apostles died out where they could have a vote to pass it. And, you know, they tried for years and years to do it, but they kept getting blocked by members of the apostles. I mean, and, and that's just one thing out of hundreds that I learned in these books that I'd never heard before. Um, and so it, it really started, started me in, on a quest for truth. During this time, I uh, became a member of the bishopric. And so I, I loved the people I worked with. Um, just amazing, amazing individuals. In fact, I think Seattle's just filled with those types of people. I mean, um, a little bit progressive, um, not as fundamental. Um, smart. Smart, op open to questions, right, where they didn't shut you down if you had questions. I kept a lot of this stuff internal because I didn't, one, I, I, I didn't have a community to go to to even discuss it. I, I don't even know. I mean, Reddit didn't exist. And... Or if it did, I didn't know about it. Um, you know, exmormon.org didn't exist. Mormon Stories podcast didn't exist. I mean, I didn't, I didn't have anybody to talk to. Yeah. And so for me, that's I why I started Mormon Stories. Yeah. Because nothing existed. Yeah. I didn't even know I could talk to you. Right. And so I, I um, we were going through this at the same time. At the same time. But neither of us felt like no. we could talk to each other. Yeah. I mean, how would I even know, really? Yeah. yeah. And so you didn't, you didn't know. I don't think I knew at that okay. time. Okay. Okay. No, yeah. I don't think I did. Um, and so, you know, I remember reading some things about how Joseph Smith had a bar in his home. And then, you know, during, during gospel doctrine, they were discussing Nauvoo time period. And I brought that up and everybody's looking at me like I'm crazy. And, and so I would try to bring up things and I would get shot down and I, I started to feel like I was starting to get a little fringy. So I pulled back. I, I just didn't know what to do. Um, for me, it was almost like a treasure hunt. I mean, no pun intended, but it was like a treasure hunt where I was, I was learning information that no one knew about. And it kind of made me feel special, um, where I wasn't necessarily losing my faith, but I, I just thought, I can't believe that people don't know about this. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because I didn't know how else to be. I couldn't leave the church. I'm in the bishopric. I couldn't talk to Molly about it because, you know, I, I, I'm not a good communicator at all when it comes to things like that. I mean, whether it's sex, religion or anything, it's, you know, you just kind of keep it to yourself and sweep it under the rug um, because that's how I was taught as a Mormon. You don't bring that up or you get, you get shot down or you get punished or you get guilt and shame. 
And like, like with your mom. Yeah, exactly. And, and with, with, you know, lots of experiences, my mission president, for example. And so I just learned to keep it all inside. And I never told her, never told her, even though these books were sitting around, I think, I think Molly just thought, oh, these are just Mormon history books. That's kind of cool. Jeremy's really studying Mormonism. You know, he's in the <laughs> bishopric and, and I loved being in the bishopric. I really did. Um, you know, just a great ward up in Snoqualmie, great people. I, I love the camaraderie that I had with the, the, the members and the, and the bishop, um, just, and the stake president, the best stake president I've ever known in my entire life, Alan Dance. I mean, he went, he became a mission president up in Alaska, just lovely, lovely individual. So I can't speak more highly about uh, the people that I worked with. Um, they were very kind to me and my family. And so anyway, I, I start to go down this road of, of reading and researching. I can't remember when Mormon Enigma comes out or Rough Stone Rolling, but I end up buying those books and reading more and more and getting deeper and deeper into Mormon history. And uh, I hear rumor that I'm going to, going to become the new bishop. And um, I just, I, I couldn't do it. I, I couldn't accept the call of being a bishop um, with the, the current situation that I was in uh, mentally. And so Molly and I had been bantering about uh, moving to Sun. Um, you know, she, the, the year we decided to move, uh, she, we had 180 days of straight rain up in Seattle. And, um, and in fact, one time we, we flew down to Vegas and my son looks out the window, he was three, and he asked what the glowy thing was in the sky. <laughs> He'd, three years old, he didn't realize that the sun could be so bright, he didn't know what it was. And so we, Molly and I basically decide to to move, and we looked around. I wanted to move to Arizona because I love Scottsdale, and um, she visited, and it was just stark. I mean, you can imagine Snoqualmie, trees, mountains, beauty, green, going down to desert cactus and shrubbery, and and so we're like, okay, let's compromise. We know friends in St. George. Um, you know, they Las Vegas has a has a big airport that I can fly in and out of. I can start my business tanga down there, and so in 2006 we moved to St. George. Um, which was amazing for her and really, really horrible for me. Um, uh, even though there are some just amazing people that I met down there, um, the Platuses who you've met in Italy, um, the most amazing people, some of our best friends, and, and we just love them to death. A lot of my interactions with, with Mormons and members of the church down there were, was not fantastic, um, especially as I was continuing to d dive deeper and going down the rabbit hole of, of my faith uh, journey and reading more and more about Mormon history. And so we, we ended up moving down there. My kids were, were in grade school. And um, I, I spent a lot of time just, just reading and researching to the point where it became an obsession. Um, Molly just couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. Uh, you know, is he having an affair? Is he going through a midlife crisis? You know, why, why is he sitting there on the computer all the time researching and reading um, and not interacting with the family? And I was trying to build Tanga at the time, so I was spending a lot of time on Tanga. And then when I was at the office, I'd, I'd be on the internet researching and reading and um, ordering more books to read. And, and at that time, I, uh, I would travel quite a bit. And I actually met a few people that, that you and I both know from our Seattle ward. And we were, we were kind of doing the, oh, where's everybody at? Like he had just come back to Microsoft. And I was meeting him at Microsoft and talking to him about what he was planning on doing. Super successful guy at Microsoft. And, he, and I said, well, what's going on with John DeLynn? He's like, oh, John, yeah, that guy's gone off the deep end. He's playing on the fringes. It's not going to be good for him. You know, I wouldn't recommend looking at anything he's doing. And I think, I, I, didn't, I don't know when I found out that you were actually doing a podcast. It could have been during this time frame that, you know, 2008, 2009 time frame. Um, and, and so it, what's funny is, is I never actually looked at what you were doing. I just knew about what you were doing, even though I was kind of going through the same thing. I almost distanced myself from you because someone in authority that I trusted and loved and had a, ton more, a lot more success than I ever had told me to stay away from you and not listen to, to, to what you were doing. And, and so I, I actually never looked at your podcast, which is just incredible to me, to me now. I think it would have saved me years and years of, of pain if I would have been able to... To, to join the community and, and listen to people's stories about how they stayed in the church because I was struggling. I, my, my faith was pretty much gone. Um, I was doing music again in the board, so I didn't have a high-powered calling. 
I was just going through the basics in terms of Mormonism, still doing family home evenings, still doing family prayer, um, but not really being able to open up to my wife, um, which super unfortunate, right? I mean, I should be able to tell her everything and just those feelings of guilt and shame and what is she going to think of me? What is the ward going to think of me? Um, what is my family going to think of me? Um, I, can't, I can't have these doubts. I'm destroying my family, right? So... It, it just as a quick reference, it, it, it's perfect fodder for the Stephen Hassan interview that I did on, on unhealthy organizations. I think it's called What the Mormon Church Can Learn from Cults. But we learn about the bite model, behavior, information, thoughts, and emotion. Unhealthy organizations, they control your behavior. They control the information you're able to receive. And by doing so, they control your thoughts. And they tell you who to stay away from, what information to stay away from. And, and then they use emotion of fear and guilt and shame. And it, it's, it is kind of mind boggling that you're super tech savvy by this point. You and I spent years together. We knew each other, thought of each other well, and yet somehow I can be years into my podcast. You can know about it and not even, and, and in a full fledged faith crisis. Right. And not feel like you were safe or interested or able yeah. to look into it. It's it, fascinating. It, I mean, I, other people emotionally won't care about this, but to me, I was just sitting there going, I know Jeremy's edgy. I know he knows what I'm doing. I, I remember him having questions way back then. What is going on? Yeah. <laughs> the, the math, the math didn't add up for me as to how long it took you. <laughs> right. <laughs> Frankly. <laughs> yeah. You know, and in some ways I love being Mormon. I yeah, mean, me I, too. You know, yeah. I loved it. I, yeah. I, I, even though I hated the three hours, I, I hated the dressing up. But I, you know, I loved playing the music. I loved, um, I loved the, a lot of the people that I was associating with. It, you know, it's, I'm a, I'm, I come from Brigham Young. I mean, it's just part of who I am. Yeah. It still is. Yeah. Even to this day, I just, I loved it. Yeah. Um, even though it was hard, and and even though I wasn't necessarily a believer, I, <clears throat> I I loved that aspect of it. And I, you know, the best thing is just sitting with your kids. I mean, when do we ever get time like that, right? Where we get three hours or an hour of your kids sitting with you and, and connecting in that way. That's powerful, right? And, yeah. and I think after you, you transition out of any religion, you, you still need to have those, those moments with your family. It's important. That's why I love that. And uh, so in, in one way, I felt like I couldn't do it anymore. And in other ways, I felt like I couldn't live without it. It's, it's a very interesting, I get it. <laughs> very, very interesting conundrum that yeah. I have in my, in my head going forward. And so, um, so a couple of things led us out of St. George. We lived there for four years. Um, one is just watching Mormonism from, from an aspect of living in St. George. It's very interesting because our, our ward boundaries had one non-member in it. And everybody knew what was going on in everybody's business. And you had, you had some really shady aspects of Mormonism where you had these people building multi-million dollar businesses doing fraud and stuff. And they eventually got, got arrested and the guy's in jail now. But, um, you know, you, you, we call it the Mormon Mafia where, where you just kind of have this really kind of shady stuff going on and parts of Mormonism. And then you have the really self-righteous Mormons and you have the great Mormons. You have all of these groups because it's so homogenous. Everybody's Mormon. You, you, it was just interesting to look at it from a lens of a non-believer and just kind of dissecting how everything was playing out. And it was hard for me to make sense of it all. Um, very emotionally taxing. Um, and, and then I write these funny Christmas letters. And so that was kind of my thing. Every year I would, I would send out three or 400 of these Christmas letters to friends across the, the United States that I had met. And, um, and they were a little ir irreverent, um, but super funny. I mean, I had people just telling me how much they just love these letters. Don't ever take me off your Christmas letter list. I really want to get your Christmas letter. And so I made the mistake of sending it to some of the bishopric members in my ward. And I get a, I get a call and I'm supposed to go visit the, the bishopric. And so I come in and meet these guys. And, and at, at the same time, I needed to renew my temple recommend. I'm just like, oh, my gosh, I, I don't know if I can do this, but I just got to I got to get through this and get my temple recommended because, I mean, you can't be a Mormon without it. And what would Molly think and what would my family think? And so I'm in there and, and before he whips out the temple recommend questions, he's like, I, I really have something important to talk to you about. And, you know, this letter that I received from you is just incredibly offensive. And I can't believe some of the things you said in it. And um, give us an example of something you may have said, in you know, world. like one time Molly had a, um, she's had a lot of laparoscopies because she's had a lot of problems with, 
um, her ovaries and cysts and endometriosis. And so one time we got a picture of the ovary that was taken out and I put it in the Christmas letter and named it. And <laughs> I mean, just st stupid stuff like that. Right. And, and I, 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 my mom had lost a lot of weight. And so I said, we were hiking in Zion's and she fell off the cliff and she, you know, with the extra skin she had, she glided <laughs> down to hurricane and we picked her up in hurricane. I mean, so, I mean, it was, it was just kind of irreverent, funny stuff. I mean, nothing really crazy. Um, but, but this guy had a problem with it, right? He did not like it at all and he called me out on it and said, you know, he was really thinking about not giving me a temple recommend. But it wasn't like Joseph's a fraud or like... No, no, never. <laughs> I, I touched on the um, culture of Mormonism. I made fun of the way that people speak and... Um, so jello and... Yeah, like know, mountain and, uh, and meal deal for meal deal. And so I, I would make fun of Mormon culture and, and the way Mormons are and the way they dress and their haircuts and... But nothing to the point where I was like calling out leaders or saying that, that um, you know, I didn't believe in the church. So it was nothing like that. But this guy just thought that it was inappropriate and didn't, didn't deem me worthy of having a temple recommend. And I almost just got up and walked out. I should have. I just, I just apologized and he gave me my, my temple recommend. And um, Molly found out about it and she, through, not even from me, through, through other people found out that, that what had happened, I don't know how it got around the ward, but the rumor mills and these words, especially when you're so close together, um, it's just crazy. I mean, everybody knew exactly what was going on. So she felt embarrassed and I felt embarrassed. And, and at that point, I'm like, Molly, we got to get out of here. Like, I, I can't run my business out of St. George. I'm constantly driving to Vegas to fly out and I can't hire people here. There's no tech. Um, and, and I'm just not comfortable here. It's just not working for me. And the, the, the straw that broke the camel's back is she gave me a massage envy gift certificate for Christmas and I go in to get my massage and I'm in the waiting room with another lady and in walks this really cute brunette and in walks a woman in a full on polygamous dress with clothes down to her wrists and a massage envy polo shirt over her polygamous dress and she had the, the braid and she, I'm like, I'm gonna get called by the polygamist. And so I thought I was being punked. And so I, I go in and I get this massage by this fundamentalist polygamous woman that happens to have a job at Massage Envy. And she's literally rubbing me, not with her elbows, but with her like cotton scratchy dress. Like as she's rubbing me and I seriously thought I was being punked. Like I didn't even know what to say to her. So tell me about your family or, you know, I just sat there stone faced the entire time. And so I go home, I'm like, Molly, we are leaving St. George and we're getting the hell out of here right now. <laughs> And so we, we moved, like she said, okay, let's do it. And so we moved down to, to Arizona. And, uh, and that's really kind of where the, my faith crisis. Gilbert, hit. Gilbert, right? We, we were in Gilbert. So we were back in the heart of Mormonville. Um, in it's a like very, Provo, Arizona. It is. And it's a very wealthy area where all of the mission presidents, the state presidents, and, you know, the temple president's son lives there and in our, in our ward boundaries. It's so right back into the heart of it. Um, you know, the, I, I think when you find Molly wanted to live where there were going to be lots of Mormon kids and, and I get it, you know, and, and so we, we moved down to, to Gilbert, Arizona and, uh, and I continued my, my faith journey. And I even started to research books on how the Bible was written, like, um, misquoting Jesus and who wrote the Bible and, I just found that fascinating. Like I was using my mind of how I deconstructed Mormonism to see how Christianity was put together. And, and then I, I downloaded a few books on my Kindle from Richard Dawkins, So the God Delusion. And I had just opened up that book the night before on my Kindle. Um, the next day Molly finds it. And so she opens up my Kindle and she sees the God Delusion sitting there. And so she Googles him and realizes that I'm reading a book about atheism. And as you can imagine, I hadn't told her a thing up until this point. So I had been... I'd been in a faith crisis, non-believing for almost 10 years, and I had not mentioned one thing to her. And so, you know, she sees this and I get home and she's acting weird. The kids go to bed and bam, she lets me have it. She's like, grabs my Kindle and opens it up. And she's like, you know, how do you explain this? What's going on? And she'd looked and seen the other books. I had um, Mormon history books as well on the Kindle. And, and I was completely caught off guard. Like I. I'm not a good verbal communicator in conflict at all. Like I just shut down. And so I didn't know, even know what to say to her. I just said, hey, you know, I've, I've been having some doubts. Um, and so I'm just interested in learning everything I can about what, what everybody's thinking about religion and even atheism. And I don't want this to scare you. I'm, I'm still all in, don't worry about it. Um, you know, I've, I've 
I, I found some things out about Joseph Smith's polyandry that I'd never heard about, and the race issues in the in 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 the church. I just cannot accept, and I I know that scares you, but I you know I've been struggling with it, right? And that really that's all that we said. There wasn't this because we just we didn't know how to communicate, right? We didn't know how to talk about it, and so the next day she's a mess. Like I found out later, she's crying all day. She's didn't know who to reach out to. She thought, you know, my, my husband's going to hell. This is going to destroy our eternal family. And she's just a complete mess. And, you know, true to form with our communication style, I come home the next day and we really just kind of sweep it under the rug. Um, and, and at, at that point, I, I just tried to tell her, Hey, I'm going to figure this out. And so I, reach out to you. <laughs> so you get an email. And I'm at Utah State University. You're at Utah State. Yeah. And in um, Logan. And and I send John an email and within like ten minutes you respond. <laughs> Did you know what was happening when I sent you that email? No. Oh <laughs> Cause I just said, can I talk to you? I just need, you know, ten minutes of your time. Yeah, I wouldn't have known. And so I I called John and I probably he, thought it was something with Uber Play or Oh like, maybe. Or, yeah, maybe Joel or I don't know. Yeah, I still hadn't listened to your podcast. I still yeah. had no idea what you were. I knew I knew kind of what you were doing, but not really. And so, um, you know, John gives me his phone number. I call him and I said, "Listen, I'm in. A, I I don't know what to do here. You know, I haven't had to temp, temple recommend for for a couple of years at this point, and um, and and, and I, I just didn't know how to handle the situation. And so John was awesome. Like, so this. I mean, I don't know if you remember the conversation, but you're like, okay, where are you at? Like, what, where, where, what do you believe? What do you don't believe? What do you want to have happen? And I said, you know, I'm, st I'm, I, I, I'm still holding on to some aspects of my belief, but it's pretty, you know, it's pretty much gone. I, I think the church could be a great place for me and my family to, to raise the kids, and I want to support my wife and kids. And I, um, but, it, you know, I, I can't go get my temple recommend because I can't answer these questions honestly. And, um, and you said, well, it, I wrote an article about how to, answer the temple questions where you're honest with yourself, uh, but the bishop may think something different, but you're being honest with yourself on how you're answering him. So you went through all the questions with me. That's the how to stay in the church after crisis of faith right. essay at stayalds.com. That's right. It, exactly. And yeah. so super powerful. I'd never seen that before. I'd never heard of it before. And I, I, was, I was just like, okay, this is exactly what I'm going to do. Right. Um, and during this time, um, before this happened, actually, the bishop calls me in. So somehow he gets word of my my crisis, and I get called in. And I thought I was just going to get another calling. And he sits me down and says, "Hey, I, I know you haven't had a temple recommend for a while, and I've heard you have some issues. Do you want to talk about it?" And again, caught off guard. I, I shouldn't have been, but I just completely was. And I'm like, Bishop, I'm struggling with some things in church history, um, you know, this polyandry polygamy issue, and Book of Abraham, and. <clears throat> and he just acts like shocked. Like he gets a shocked look on his face. He's like, really? I'm like, yeah, really. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, wow, you know, you're just reading anti-Mormon literature and the history doesn't necessarily mean, you know, it can be d interpreted in different ways. And you just need to get your testimony back. And I said, okay, Bishop, listen, I've been where you're at. I know what happens to people that come in and talk about this stuff. I said, please do not tell anybody in the ward. I don't want to be a project. I don't want ward council to know about this. I will deal with it and I will figure it out on my own, but please do not tell anybody. I don't want my kids to be ostracized. I don't want my wife to be ostracized. I don't want me to be this scary person that people can't talk to. Please don't talk, tell anybody. And he promised that he wouldn't. Well, that lasted for about two weeks. And then the missionaries start coming over every week and knocking on the door and how are you doing? And I get calls from, uh, the uh, elders court president wanted to come over with a high council member, even though I was a high priest at the time. Um, I get calls from <clears throat> stake president, right? So all of a sudden this starts happening um, when I asked the bishop not to say anything. Um, <laughs> and so that's, that's when I reached out to you because I knew that I had to do something because everything was coming to a head. So it was either going to go, go really badly or I was going to figure it out. Um, and so I, I come home that night, I'm sitting in bed with Molly and I'm like, okay, I talked to John DeLynn and she's like, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, no, no. I said, Molly, he's totally helped me try to figure out how I'm going to make this work. And so I explained what happened. I went through the questions with her and I said, are you okay with me answering it in this way? So I'm being honest with myself. And she's like, yeah, I, I totally, 
you know, go, go get your temple recommend. I totally support you. And so at the Gilbert Temple was being constructed. And this, I, I wasn't going to be able to get my temple recommend in order to go to the dedication. And so my kids could all go, <laughs> my wife could go, but Jeremy could not go, right? And I get a, a, a elders quorum and high council visit like a week before the temple dedication in my home. And they, and this is, they didn't know that I was going to go get my recommend. I had told Molly a couple days before that. And so they come in, they're acting all nice. And my kids are, we're sitting on the couch and my kids are at the bar eating with Molly in the, in the kitchen, but they can hear everything. And uh, all of a sudden this, this creepy high council member, um, he gets really serious and he looks at me and he's like, tell me about the spirituality of your home. And he's, he starts drilling me with questions like, you know, why don't you have a temple recommend? And, you know, what kind of things are you doing that you, you know, you can't have a testimony? And I mean, just, it, it, it just threw me off guard. And Molly was listening to this and the kids could hear it. And so after about the fifth or sixth question like that, where I was stammering and trying to explain myself, Molly comes over and she's like, you know, my husband's doing just fine. Um, you know, you, you guys just need to leave him alone. And, um, you know, we're working on this together. And, and I said, listen, guys, because you had told me, all these people want to know is that you're back in the fold. As soon as you have that temple recommend and you're back in the fold, they'll probably leave you alone. And so I, I and that you're not a threat. I'm not a threat. And so I said, listen, guys, I've put a lot of that stuff on my stuff on, on the shelf, and I'm going to go get my temple recommend next week. And they were just like, you know, the mood changed. They're like, buddy, buddy, let's play board games together. Why don't you <laughs> let's do dinner? I mean, I could just see right through it. Molly could too. For the first time, Molly's like, okay, that is unbelievable. What I just witnessed in front of my kids, what they just did to you. How would she describe it? It was unbelievable. Why? Because they were they were they were asking inappropriate questions of me in front of my wife and kids um, about where I was spiritually. Trying, uh, I mean, it was almost attacking me. That's what it felt. I felt like I was being attacked. And so as soon as I told them I was getting that recommend, they were just all buddy-buddy again. And, um, and Molly, I think for the first time, started to think, I wonder if I should just talk to Jeremy about these issues that he's having. Um, for the first time. I mean, this was back in 2014. That's only four years ago. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Yep. And so um, I go and I, I get my recommend. And the bishop says, well, what about all these issues you had? And I'm like, bishop, I'm putting them on, on the shelf. And I, I, I just want to, you know, forget about that stuff. And I'm a Mormon and I'm always going to be Mormon. And let's just move forward. <laughs> and so he gives me my recommend. And, uh, and so then I have to go to the state president. Well, Molly and I have a, a Bahamas trip. But it's actually to Ang Anguilla. And, uh, and the Warrens are with us and the Pilatuses, and my friend Josh and Michelle, who you know. And we go on this couple's trip every year. And uh, Molly starts asking me questions for the first time. Like, you know, tell me some of these things that you're experiencing. And I said, you know, it might be best if we read this document together and we can read it over this seven days. It's called the CES letter. Mm -hmm. And it really encapsulates all of the issues that I have with the church and why that I can't have a testimony in this church, why it's so hard for me to believe anymore. Um, and if you read it and we can discuss it, I think you'll totally understand where I'm coming from. And she was all on board. We put it on her, on her iPad and within three days she took off her garments. She never put them back on hmm. like three days. What well, took me 13 years it took her three days. Why is that emotional for you? All of those wasted years where we were totally disconnected because of our religious differences. If I would have just had the guts or the knowledge or the words to say to her and to talk to her about how I was feeling and talking about these issues, how much closer we would be. So much wasted time. You're thinking about for your relationship with her. Absolutely. It negatively impacted the growth that you could have had Absolutely. together. We could have, we could have been in such a different place right now. And I just couldn't tell her, I couldn't talk to her about what I was feeling and the doubts and, uh, and 
you know, she, she was amazing. I mean, she just, okay, let's figure this out. What are we doing next? What are we going to do? And, you know, we have these, these kids, you know, they're teenagers and, and they're in a high school that may as well be Orem High or Provo oh, High, right? They were in a charter school that was 90% LDS. Yeah, so it's all their friends, it's everything. their social network. Everything. Every, I did not have liter- I, a non-member friend that I hung out with. It was, it's all members. Our entire neighborhood is filled with members. Our schools, um, people I work with. And we, we had to figure out what we were going to do. And... Um, at first, we thought we could make it work. Like, you know, the church is still a great place. Let's, let's figure out how we can make this work. And then we started to get involved in, um, in Mormons Building Bridges and the All Group. So, Which is Arizona. Um, I don't know what it stands for. It's but LGBT affirming group that's, that's right. Mormon themed. In, yeah, that people in are still active and trying to make it work. Yeah. Um, and the reason why we got involved is an amazing woman named Lisa Fry out of St. George. She was in my ward, and she's part of the Mama Dragon Group. And just on Facebook, we saw that she was part of this, this group because she had a gay son. And we knew them really well. I mean, just amazing people. I, you've probably met Lisa before. And, um, and so we reached out to her and she said, oh, they've got these groups in, in Arizona where you can be an ally and you can go to these meetings and try to support people. And, um, and this is Wendy Montgomery, Meg Abhow, exactly. right? Exactly. We it's met a, Meg and, and Anessa the first time there. Anessa uh, Rochetta, Rochetta, which is exactly. Noah Rochetta's sister-in-law. Right, yep. And uh, just amazing people. We had so much fun. The cooks, right? Um, and we went to the cook's house and, and, and really got to know some of these people that were trying to make it work and, and, and being LGBT. And, uh, and we decided we were going to march in the gay pride parade. And, so, and our kids decided they were going to do it with us. And all hell broke loose in our ward. Um, we, the word apostate was being thrown around. Uh, excommunication was being thrown around. Um, we heard we heard that a ward council, one of one of our neighbors that lived behind us, broke down crying and said, "You know, I've I've um, I, I let down the youngs. I can't believe that this is happening. I should have been there for them." And we're just like, "All we're doing is, all we're doing is hugging gay people. <laughs> like we're just trying to show that we love these people and 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 show them that they." That, they're, that, that they have value and that these are the most incredible people I've ever met. I mean, the gay people we know that are in our lives are the most sensitive, loving, caring, wonderful people that I've ever met in my life. And all we were doing is marching in a parade saying, we love you and support you. And all hell breaks loose on my ward. So the rumor goes around that the only reason that I'm struggling with the church that the, is because I'm gay, right? So, so that was the rumor that was going around the whole ward, you know, because I like to cook. I'm play music. Play music. I speak French. Must be gay. I yeah, totally. So <laughs> and LGBT affirming. Yeah, yeah. So you know, because I'm out there marching, I've got to be gay. And even even parts of my family, extended family, were were on the bandwagon. You know, Jeremy's gay, totally. <laughs> and um, and so that that was just it was just shocking to me that all of this was happening because we were trying to love a group of people that are ostracized uh, within our community. Just shocking. And so that happened. Our kids still wanted to go to church. And so we supported them for, for months and months um, because they knew what would happen if we left. And uh, eventually they just, you know, they wouldn't get up in the morning and Molly and I were fighting and screaming at them and saying, hey, you gotta get up for church, come on, let's go. And that lasted a couple months and finally we just sat them down and said, guys, listen, we're only going because you want to go. Um, and if you're not going to get up for church, we're gonna stop going. Um, if that's what you want, but this is what will happen. We'll lose all of our friends. You will probably have to change schools. Um, you will, uh, we may even have to move, but if this is what you want and this is how you're feeling, we support you hundred percent. And during this time, as we started to become more progressive in our Mormonism, uh, like our, my daughter, my middle daughter, she is with some friends at Barnes and Noble and they go and get a Starbucks, a vanilla shake, but it has the Starbucks symbol on it. And they're in the Starbucks cafe in Barnes and Noble. Those two girls were no longer allowed to hang out with my daughter because they Instagrammed a Starbucks cup of vanilla shake. So those types of things kept happening more and more. And we just didn't know how we could become, we could stay in the community that treated us that way. Jeremy's gay. 
Julia is an apostate for getting Starbucks vanilla shakes. You know, McKenna this, you know, we didn't know how to deal with it all. It was just so confusing and so hard. And it started to make me want to lash out at the church in ways that I knew were unhealthy because of that crazy culture that I knew that it wasn't going to last. Your Facebook post started to get more heated. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I wasn't super heated until the November policy. That's when it, it really, I, I lost it. Um, and in November, 2015, I remember reading that policy and laughing out loud. Like I, I I remember this cannot be real. Like (laughs) how could any Christian religion release a policy that says, if you are a child of a gay person, you can no longer participate in the church, be baptized, uh, have a blessing. And not only that, when you turn 18, you have to move out of your parents' home and, um, Denounce, denounce, renounce, denounce yeah. them as a human being and as their parent. And then you have to get permission from the prophet to be baptized or go on a mission. I mean, I, I, I couldn't even fathom that something like that could even exist or happen. It is ridiculous. Religion. It's ridiculous. It's the most crazy thing I've ever heard in my life. And so at that point, um, we sat down with the kids. We had been going to church for nine, ten months. And we just said, listen, you know, this is what's just happened. How do you feel about it? And they were just disgusted by it. And, um, and we said, we want to resign. We want to take our names off the, off the rolls. And we all agreed. And around November 15th to the 20th, we submitted our resignation uh, through Quit Mormon and resigned from the church. Um, we didn't feel like we could support an organization that had such hateful policies towards people we loved. You know, Yeah, we, when we were at the uh, Mormons building bridges booth, um, we met this young man that just got off his mission and, uh, he's almost like a son to me and he, he's got off his mission at the age of 27. He went late, came out as gay. His parents kind of disowned him. And he was trying to go to school in Arizona and he's become a part of our family. And he spends holidays with us, spends Christmas with us last year, actually for several years, three years now. Um, Babysat our kids last week when Amali and I were in Santa Barbara. And uh, he's the most amazing human being. And if, if they're gonna treat him that way, don't wanna be a part of it. Couldn't be a part of it anymore. I didn't want to resign, but they forced our hand. And so I wouldn't change anything. So if they're going to, if they're gonna sort the, the wheat from the chaff, put me in the pile of the LGBT members of the church and their children. Well, that's a dramatic uh, climax to that story. How have things been since? Um, you know, there's good parts and bad parts. You know, we what's are... Been the, what's been hard and then what's been the blessing? And that'll lead us to the sommelier stuff. Yeah, so our kids um, lost their friends. They switched schools. Um, we lost our friends. Even the most progressive of our friends that we would travel with, that we would... That we would um, um, that we'd hang out with all the time. Uh, we lost contact with them. Not from us, not trying. I mean, I reached out several times trying to, to continue relationships and we lost them all. And so we ended up moving. Um, and uh, it, it's been tough. In some ways, it's been really hard for the family and the kids. And in some ways, it's been a blessing. Um, it's interesting because our kids tell us everything. Um, now that we're out of the church, our kids, more Molly than me, tell her everything. And so we're able to have these conversations about life, about sexuality, um, about dating, um, about anything. And our kids will tell Molly everything. And they will, um, you know, that relationship has just been super, super strong. And um, what's an interesting is, you know, our, our kids still used to hang out with a lot of Mormon people. Um, a lot of, a lot of our daughter's friends are going on missions and, 
you know, and, and you see some of these kids that are kind of Mormon royalty, and we know that they've been having sex with their girlfriend right before they went on a mission, and they, you know, they get in the MTC and they write my daughter's letters and ask for pictures, you know, nude pictures, and um, and those types of things are 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 interesting because they consider my family and my kids the apostates, but yet you know some of these Mormon kids who are acting um, in a certain way that. You know, if, there, if, if we have missionaries that are writing my daughters from the MTC asking for nudes, um, you know, that's, it's a little ironic that, that my daughters are not doing anything that the Mormons would consider bad, but yet my daughters are a threat, my family's a threat because of our apostate views. Um, I don't know, it's just ironic. It's ironic. And so in some ways it's, it's, been, it's been great. In some ways we miss the community. We miss that Sunday time with the kids. Um, we've replaced some of that with like watching Oprah Soul Sunday or um, you know, doing something as a family on Sunday and trying to, to, to still have that time uh, with the family. So it's come at a cost. Yeah, in some ways it has and in some ways it's, it, it's, it's been so great. I mean, just the communication that we have with the kids now, especially with Molly and the kids. Um, How's that different? Well, I, th I think in uh, before we would, it, especially me, might do the shame and guilt thing, right? Because that's what I grew up with. And so if if our kids um, came to them with a with a question about sex, it may be that we handle that completely different now. Where it's like, okay, let's talk about it. You know, this is, you know, these are the pros and cons of what you're thinking about, or um, you know, this is the risks that that are involved. Where now, um, and before it may be, you, hey, that's, a, that's against uh, the law of chastity. Don't you dare do that. You know, we wouldn't even have a discussion around it. And, and so it's been much better on the communication for sure. So you feel like, and this is common, that if you handle it right, you become a better parent by not parenting through guilt and shame and control, but instead through emotional connection. That's right. And you're finding that your emotional connection with your children has increased. Absolutely. Yeah. And then oftentimes, you know, you got emotional uh, talking about the last decade plus of more healthy emotional intimacy with Molly. To what extent have you guys uh, been able to start working to either repair some of the distance that grew between you? Sure. But also improve your ability to talk about hard things and to be vulnerable. Right. Talk about that. Yeah, it's still a struggle, right? It, I mean, it's just core to who I am, not being able to, to talk about hard things. And, you know, and after our faith crisis, you start to ask yourself questions like, what do we really believe anymore? What is truth to us? What, what do we want to do with our marriage? Like, should we be together? Uh, do we really love each other? Um, are we only married because Mormonism made us or put us together and, and, you know, do we want to be married, right? So there are all of these questions, um, you know, we've contemplated and we've talked about. And, uh, and sometimes it can even be the marriage was right for a time, but maybe it's not right for the future. Right. And we tend to always talk about happy endings. Right. But, but sometimes couples get to the point where they say maybe... Right. It is, maybe it isn't. Yeah, exactly, right. And, you know, we asked, we've asked each other those questions. and That's not easy. It's not easy, especially when you're not used to talking about really emotional, hard things like that. Um, you know, we've, we've had therapists that uh, we worked with. I mean, we talked to you and Margie, which has been super helpful. Um, you know, we go to a therapist now that help, more, I think, um, for me, helps me learn how to communicate. Uh, Molly's been through 20 years of therapy. She's a psychology major, and she's... She's really, really good at understanding herself, and I'm trying to play catch up now. It could take years, um, but it was tough, super, super tough. Um, you know, at some point, did we think we, we, we thought maybe this isn't going to work? And um, you know, thanks to thanks to you guys, and thanks to other therapists, and and we, we I think we're we're starting to get to a place where where we feel like things are, are going okay and moving towards things are going great. And we have those moments of greatness as, as everybody does. Um, you know, when you have business struggles and you have kid, kid struggles and, you know, your, your kids are struggling through their teenage years and it, it creates a lot of, um, a lot of pressure and anxiety within a family unit. And so when you're dealing with a, a faith crisis and business issues and, and teenage issues and, 
and kids bullying my my daughter Julia because of her her blog and her um, you know her YouTube channel and her Instagram and and you you get all of this pressure that creates um, you know it, it's it's hard to have a marriage in that type of pressure situation and so we're rebuilding from scratch like okay what do we believe what do we believe in Christianity what do we believe in God you know, what do we believe in morality? What do we believe in the word of wisdom? I mean, what we had to look at, you know, I've always been a conservative um, Republican my whole life, like straight ticket Republican. And so what I had to, after I left Mormonism, I'm like, why am I doing this? Like, are there reasons why I'm doing this? Do I actually believe it? Or am I just following a party line that I've always followed? I got to really dig into this and find out what, what my political beliefs are and what I, what I find value in. So all of that had to be reconstructed. And it takes years. It really does. And we were still working at it. Still working at it. Yeah. So talk about how this, uh, how we take this straight-laced conservative uh, Mormon, and now you're like have this love affair with wine. Um, I, I think it's it's it, it's weird. So I'll just say, uh, Jeremy and Molly were really generous. They they actually sponsored me and Margie on a trip to Italy um, a couple year 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 two, two, years, ago. two years ago. Uh, you know, we, we was just finishing grad school. We haven't been able to afford trips like that. We still kind of can until just recently, but so it meant a lot to us. And, um, they take us to this beautiful vineyard in Tuscany, Tuscany. And, uh, we do this tour of the vineyard and, and we didn't drink and, and I still don't like for me, I've decided that alcohol isn't something I, wa I want or need to introduce into my life right now. I get a lot of crap for it. I get asked about it all the time. So I don't want anyone to think this is like some, hey, everyone should drink alcohol. Having said that, Molly, uh, Margie and I noticed just how much Jeremy and Molly loved the art of wine. It was, I don't even know that it really was the, and Jeremy will talk about, you know, whether he likes the effects of alcohol in his body, but it, it was very clear that they have grown one of the things that's emerged from your crisis is this passion for something, for good food and good wine and good friendships. Yeah. So talk about how that happened. Absolutely. It's interesting. Yeah. And so, you care about this. Oh, absolutely. Um, okay. Let, a couple of years after after we left, we just decided. That, By the way, it's only a couple of years ago. Yeah, yeah. It's only been a couple of years. <laughs> and so we we decided that we wanted to try wine for the first time. And so what do we do? We book a trip to Napa Valley because hey, we, that's where the best wine is made, right? So we, we book a trip to Napa Valley. We check into the hotel and I go to the concierge. And I'm like, listen, I am an ex-Mormon. I've never had wine. I need you to recommend some place where, you know, we can go tasting. We didn't even know what that meant. <laughs> like, as a Mormon, you're driving past vineyards. You're not even seeing them because it's just not even in your, in your worldview, right? And so... Um, you know, we go to this beautiful area of California. There's vineyards everywhere. There's these big castles and chateaus and tasting rooms. We had no idea what we we're doing. I didn't know a Cabern Cabernet grape from a Chardonnay grape. I didn't know, uh, I didn't even know what the effect of alcohol would have on my body. Like we knew nothing. And so she recommends this castle. It's called Castello de Amorosa and it's in Cast uh, Castello Castelloga. Don't ask me. <laughs> uh, it's just right north of Napa. I can't remember the name of the, the city. But anyway, it's uh, this guy <clears throat> imported like 29 containers of bricks and furnishings from Tuscany, from a castle over there, and then recreated the castle in Napa. It's 110,000 square feet. Like five floors underground where they keep the barrels and the tasting rooms and, and then the, the winemaking facilities and they've got a dungeon and a chapel. It's, I mean, even, even if you don't drink wine, you got to go tour this place. It's pretty fascinating. And there's vineyards surrounding it. It's just the most beautiful place. A lot of people now scoff at it and say it's the Disneyland of Napa Valley, so they won't go drink there. But, but we, just, we just thought it was incredible. And so we're, we're going to pay for our tastings. And they're like, would you like the standard tasting or would you like the reserve tastings? And we're like... Give us the reserve. I mean, we had no idea what we were even, <laughs> what that even meant. <laughs> and so I pay my thirty dollars per person, and they they take us on this tour of this castle and the, this this gentleman that owns several wineries in Napa. This is his passion, and this is what he created, and this is how wine is made, and this is how long it takes, and the fermentation is this, and it's in these it's in these sterile uh, steel fermentation tanks for so long, and then then the juice gets racked and put into barrels, and the barrels get taken underground, and. And it was just fascinating. And we had never heard of any of this before. And we saw the passion of, of people creating wine and, and, and what drove them to do it. 
and so we get down to the bottom of this of this castle in the tasting room and there is a tasting table and there's 10 of us lined up and they give us the sheets and we're supposed to mark off the wines that we want to taste and so we had no idea like we, we had no idea what any of these wines were what it even meant and so we just start marking off and, th and they had some grape juice and dessert wine so we made sure we we took those so we knew we would like that um and and so they give us our first drink and it's a chardonnay we're looking at it and like checking people okay people are swirling it so we're trying to figure out how that works and so we're swirling and you're supposed to smell it we didn't know what we were doing and 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 we take our first sip and molly's like oh she's like this is awful i can't drink this and i'm like well and she's like and what happens if we drink all these wines are, am i are we going to be drunk i mean we didn't know what it would do like are you going to be able to drive and i'm like i don't know and so we're all nervous and i didn't really like it either and um, and, and I said, but they're going to pour another tasting pretty soon, and we're using the same glasses. And so there's a trash can in the corner. So I'm going to distract everybody. I'm going to give you this wine. You go over and dump it in the trash. And so <laughs> I start telling a joke or something, and Molly goes over and dumps the wine in the, in, in the trash bucket, comes back, and they give us our next one, taste it. Another Chardonnay, same thing. She dumps it. After like the third or fourth time, the, the lady that's giving us the taste, she's like, what are you doing? And we're like, well, listen... We just left the Mormon church and we've never had wine before. And everybody starts screaming, right? It's just like this, oh my gosh, I can't believe it. I'm like, we don't even know what we're doing or what we're tasting or what this even means. And, and so at the end, she gives us a dessert wine. She's like, oh, you're going to love this. And we did. And we bought some bottles of dessert wine and some grape juice for the kids. And, but that was our first experience of tasting wine. And that was three years ago, maybe. <laughs> I, mean, it's, um, I mean, it hasn't been that long. And so then I just say, okay, you know, there's got to be something to this. Let's continue our, our diving into the wine and figure out how it pairs with food. And so we spent, we spent years just listening to podcasts and I read probably a dozen books on wine and the different regions and how wine is made and, um, you know, the different grapes and how tannic, which means tannin means like how dry the wine is. And that means like when you, when you take a sip, it'll actually dry out your mouth. And that's, that's why they say it's dry. And, um, or how sweet something is, or how acidic a wine is, and how it pairs with food. And since I love to cook, I just dove into it and started pairing wines with everything that I was doing. And just fell in love with it. And not only that, we travel so much abroad going and visiting these wineries like we did with you. I think we went to Cetriolo. Susanna cooked us lunch right on her patio. Yeah, it was amazing. Yeah. And so she this Tuscan. We're in the middle of these vineyards in this forest. And... And this beautiful winemaker, Susanna, that took over her, her grandfather's vineyard. And her and her mother make the wines. And they make 9,000 bottles. And it's her passion. I mean, she, she was a psychologist in Florence. Yeah. She quit mm -hmm. to come and, and take over her grandfather's vineyard because it's just her passion. And her and her mom do all the work. And they make these beautiful Chiantes um, and Reservas and Super Tuscans. And just to sit with her in, her in her living room and hear her story and connect on that personal level while you're enjoying something that she's so passionate about that she made three or four years ago that's been sitting in barrel and sitting in, in bottle. And to hear her story about that, uh, about how she made that particular vintage and the, the problems that she had with it and how much it means to her. And um, it's just, it, it's, a, it's a spiritual experience. It really is. It, okay, so yeah, let me, let me ask you directly. So... From a Mormon's perspective, wine's evil, it's bad. It do, you admitted it didn't taste good at first. Right. And, um, and then we've got the problem of, you know, it, it potentially has some health risks. And so, and then you've admitted that you've had to learn and, and develop and study it. That sounds like a lot of work. Mm. So, so someone would say, how do you get from that to this idea that it's beautiful and intimate and special? Right. If, if, it, if it's dangerous, if it doesn't taste good, if you have to work to even let it taste good, mm -hmm. and then you have to do all this work just to appreciate it, doesn't that just mean it's bad? Why are you working right. to develop a love for something that someone might perceive as just being evil? Yeah. I apologize about the sweat. It's like about, it feels like it's 100 degrees in here. I apologize. <laughs> That's our fault. Uh, we turn off the AC so the audio quality yeah, is good. Yeah, exactly. So. And so... Um, you look great. <laughs> um, so... That's a good question. One is... Like there's a million things you could love. Well, the Mormon, the Mormon palate, right, is Diet Coke and sweet. That's the Mormon palate. Like sodas, Diet Cokes. Um, thank you. A little water. Thanks, thank Tim. Thank you so much. 
And so I think it was because of that palate. It's like the first time you drank coffee. If you were to drink coffee black, it would taste horrible, right? Bitter. How does anyone ever drink this stuff? And so you add a little bit of cream, you add some sugar, and it's good. And then eventually you cut back the sugar, you cut back the cream, and pretty soon, you know, you may be drinking cream with a dash of milk. I mean, coffee with a dash of milk and no sugar, right? I mean, that's how Mormon palates are developed because we're so used to the sugary aspect. Well, wine's the same way. And so what you can do is you start off with um, a sweet Riesling or, um, and, or um, you know, and then you move to a Sauvignon Blanc or you drink a Moscato from Italy that's sparkly and fresh, low alcohol. Um, and then your palate starts to change. You start to develop um, a, a sense for like a, a dry, crisp Chardonnay from Burgundy, um, a white wine. Uh, and then eventually you, you'll, you'll start to eat a steak and, and you'll have a beautiful Cabernet that, that balances perfectly with the, uh, the fat of the steak. And so it, it's a progression, right? And I think it's the same way with anything that you do. Um, pretty soon, it's, I don't like the effects of alcohol on my body. It makes me tired, it makes me sleepy. What I do love is knowing where that bottle came from, understanding the story behind it, understanding the passion behind how that wine was made. Um, understanding the heritage of the winemakers and, and how it's been passed on for 400 years from family to family, you know, father to son. And then how that wine interacts with the food that I'm drinking and reliving that experience of sitting in, in Susanna's home with her having lunch and drinking her wines. Molly and I get to recreate that every time we open up a bottle of her wine. I get to make a pasta, open that up, and we get to relive that experience uh, with her. And in, in terms of like, is, is alcohol bad? I mean, I don't, early, I don't know how much you've gone into it, but early Mormonism, I mean, people drink alcohol all the time. Um, we had, uh, Joseph Smith had two bottles of wine smuggled into the jail the night before he died. He had a bar in his home at the mansion house. Brigham Young owned distilleries and breweries and wineries over, all over Utah and in California. Um, we even had a prophet of the church that, that it was an admitted alcoholic um, because he drank too much beer, Heber J. Grant. Um, so in terms of it being wrong or being evil, uh, Jesus drank wine. And you, now that I know that, that it wasn't grape juice, like Jesus did not drink grape juice because <laughs> grapes only mature to the point where you might have a week or two where you could squeeze fresh grape juice into a cup and then drink grape juice. They weren't drinking grape juice, they were drinking wine. I mean, this beverage has been made for millennia and it's got a history, and everybody does it a little different. Um, it's just the, it is the most fascinating thing because it's always different. Every year it's different vintage. Every year has a different flavor. The same location, the same grapes, a different vintage has a different flavor than the year before. And you, you could spend an entire lifetime learning about it and researching it. It's, it's a fascinating thing. And so what are the values that underpin your newfound love for wine and food? I, I don't think it's... Somebody could say, well, yeah, as you're learning to like different types of wine, you're going down the slippery slope to hell of debauchery and sin, right? But I don't think it's even about the alcohol. What is it? Uh, I think we've heard you say it, but if you had to summarize your love for, for alcohol and food, it's what? Yeah, and I wouldn't even call it alcohol because yeah, I, can, I consider wine a food product, right? I consider wine something that you just eat with, you, you get a glass with dinner and it pairs and it's actually part of the experience. It's about experience, it's about connection, it's about Connection love, with? Connection with the, the grape growers, connection with the people around you that you're sharing this bottle and telling the story. A lot of times we'll open up, like in, we were just with Molly's birth family in uh, Santa Barbara for her birthday uh, last week. And I brought some 1974 bottles of Barolo and Barbaresco. And so we got, to, we got to share stories about, okay, what were we doing in 1974? Well, Molly was in utero. Um, you know, the birth father was explaining what was happening before you, they gave up Molly for adoption. Um, I was explaining my memories from 1974 because I have a few when I was little. Um, and so when, when we opened up to 1993, because we're also celebrating our 25th wedding anniversary, we got to explain what we were all doing in 1993. It's about connection. It's about sharing. Um, it's not about the alcohol. I mean, even if wine didn't have alcohol, it would still be an amazing, um, amazing drink if people made it. I mean, for me, it's definitely not about the alcohol. I don't love the effects of alcohol. It makes me sleepy. Yeah. It makes me depressed. Um, it's and intimacy, isn't it's it? It's intimacy. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that's what's been missing my whole life is that those intimate moments. Let me share one story. So we went to Lyon last summer. Lyon is in the south part of Burgundy in France. 
and we took uh, my two daughters. And I made an appointment with a Beaujolais producer called Chateau Tivon. And this guy has had this winery in his family for generations, probably seven, eight generations. And he didn't speak much English, but I was translating and we were communicating in French. Nicest guy, beautiful vineyards. His, his wines are distributed all over the world. And so we're, we're, he takes us down to his cellar and he's telling us stories about his grandpa. And his grandpa had this beautiful truck and it was still there, it's a Citrion. And he would deliver wines to the neighbors and um, we got to sit in the truck and take pictures. And then he takes us down into the cellars, and these cellars were built in the 1400s. So he's telling us the history of the cellars and um, his passion for winemaking and how he's passing that on to his family. And he takes us out to the vineyards, the same thing as he's showing us the berries. And, and then we go into his house. He takes us into his house. I mean, we, we don't know this guy from Adam. He sits us down at the, at the dining room table, and he starts going to the kitchen. He cuts bread and cheese and meat and gives it to us, and he's opening up old vintages from a cellar. So he's got a 1990 and a 19, uh, um, a, a 2009 that he opened up, and, and he's just sharing. I mean, he did not ask for a single dime. He spent two hours with us, the most lovely individual. It was all about connecting. I mean, why would anyone do that? There was no monetary gain for him to do that. These people are just so passionate about what they do that we got to experience something that no one else gets to experience. We got to connect with that that lovely man about his passion of wine, his family history, um, the stories of winemaking throughout the ages. He shared food with us. At the end, my, you know, my daughters, they were 18 and 17 at the time. You know, they got to, they got to experience that. They got to taste the wine. They got to, you know, they were actually teary eyed and crying when we left because they had such an emotional, amazing experience. And that's, that's how wine feels for us. It's about the experience and the connection. Um, and that's beautiful. And it's, you know, there are risks, but there's risks with water. There's risks with swimming. There's risks with driving your car. There's risks with overeating. There's risks with taking pain medication, sugar. like I mean, sugar. How, how, many, how many Mormons are just overdosing on sugar and Diet Coke? Like, I know, I know, I think my bishop drank a 62 ounce thing of <laughs> Diet Mountain Dew every, or Diet Dr. Pepper every single day. I mean, there's risks with that. You just have to be smart and, and uh, do it right. And so when the church says, woe unto those who call good evil and evil good, what you're telling me is you have found that uh, wine can be a beautiful, good thing it's, in your life. It's amazing. You're bearing your testimony about wine. Well, it's amazing. I mean, I just went to Cleveland. So I did a songwriting um, uh, seminar with Jim Brickman. He's one of my idols. Just a couple of weekends ago, Molly got it for our anniversary. I, I contacted a guy that I knew on a wine board named Lauren Sonken. He's a a uh, lawyer in Cleveland. Him and his wife went to dinner with me. Um, they didn't know me at all. I just said, hey, I'm passionate about wine. These are some of my interests. They brought 700 to $1,000 worth of, of old wines for us to share. I mean, who does that? I mean, for, it was just this connection. We talked for five hours straight. We could have talked all night. And so now, I mean, this guy, if, if, I, if they ever come to Arizona, it's just this instant connection with people. It just, it unites people. It creates stories. It creates passion. It's it's incredible. And, and Jesus drank wine. Joseph <laughs> Smith drank wine. So if Jesus, the most perfect individual who's never sinned. And Joseph's number two. Joseph's number two. If both of those guys can drink wine their whole lives, I think I'm okay with the glass Joseph of Joseph drank the night before he was murdered. He did. He had two bottles of wine smuggled in and he, he drank before he was murdered. And so, you know, I, if Brigham Young can, can own breweries and distilleries and wineries in California... I think I can have a glass of wine at dinner. <laughs> Jeremy, we're going to have you back. Um, Margie and I are working on a new project uh, um, called The Gift of the Mormon Faith Crisis. And um, it's, it's going to be accessible at mormonfaithcrisis.com. And we're going to be providing uh, you know, information to people going through a faith crisis to help them realize that even though this feels like a crisis and is actually terrible, it's an incredible gift. And one of the episodes we want is to do how to drink responsibly and how to how to enjoy alcohol. And maybe I'll have you on to Perfect. help talk about that. Sounds good. So this is just an introduction to Jeremy's experiences with wine and uh, and the beauties of, of wine. Perfect. All right, let's end real quick by talking about this uh, exciting project you have with John Hamer about Joseph Smith. Okay. 
So three and, years and ago. You may, you're looking for what? You're probably looking for people that are interested in partnering with you or yeah, exactly. supporting it? Yeah. So three years ago, I, I was in contact with a really good friend of mine from high school, uh, Anthony Nelson. And he uh, was, he, he's into film production and TV production. He produced a Saturday Night Live type of deal in Seattle. You remember Almost Live? Of course, yeah. So he was involved with that. Bill Nye was part of that, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I can't remember the names of the guys that were in it. Okay, but, long time ago. But, uh, and then he's done something recently with the same group of people, but um, he's done <clears throat> lots of pitches to major networks. And so he was, pit he was pitching me this idea of this uh, uh, religious-themed movie or series that he wanted to do, which had, had to do with Christianity in Jerusalem. And I said, well, you know, I'm, I have, have left Mormonism. Do you know anything about Joseph Smith? And he said he really didn't. So I ordered him five or six books on Amazon. He spent a month reading these books. And he said, this is the most amazing American story that no one knows about. Um, this guy was a, a genius, a religious genius, which I agree. I think he was. It's funny how Mormons try to make Joseph Smith to be this bumpkin country boy that has no education. And the guy was a genius. Literally, when you get to understand the history of Joseph Smith like I do, uh, incredible uh, what he was able to accomplish. And so anyway, I, I said, well, you know, what we should do is create a series, um, kind of like Deadwood or Big Love, but have it be the, the life of Joseph Smith and how Mormonism was created and have it be 100% factually, historically accurate. So we don't have to make stuff up. Like, no. Like the story is it's, so incredible yeah. that we don't have to make anything up. And it's not a hit piece against Joseph. It is, I think at the end of the series, people will love him and they'll hate him. It'll be this dichotomy of, of you know, I totally understand how he was able to accomplish what he accomplished. I totally get it, right? Um, you know, but it's got, it's got sex. It's got polyandry. It's got polygamy. It's got marrying fourteen-year-old murder. Murder. It's got the assassination <laughs> attempt of Governor Boggs. It's got the day nights, day nights. It's got um, Wild West. Um, the Wild West. He dies in a shootout. He was president. <laughs> ran for president of the United States. He crowned himself king of the world. I mean, it goes on a bank bank fraud where he loses everybody's money and is chased out of Kirtland. I mean, it's got everything that you need for this amazing story to be told, and it's never been told. And so we have spent three years uh, developing uh, pilot scripts and outlines for and. Uh, Big, beautiful, call it the Bible. I call it the the Golden Bible, and it's um, you know the the story outline of of the the series. We've got Hollywood writers working on it. We've got one of the best lawyers in industry. Um, we have a, a showrunner that's looking at it that that would be able to to get this thing done immediately. Um, and so we're we're just looking for if anybody's interested, we're looking for a little bit of money um, to kind of get it across the finish line. I've put in a bunch of money. Um, over the past three years, and a couple of friends of mine have put in some some money as well. And so, if anybody's interested, contact me. Um, How do they get a hold of you? Uh, Jeremy J E R E M Y at Young Y O U N G dot org. And then, if you want to know about Jeremy at Young dot org. Jeremy at Young dot org. And then, if you want to know to contact me about wine, on Instagram, it's Mormon Wine Snobs. <laughs> Mormon Wine Snobs. And so, contact me on Instagram if you have. If you have questions about wine or want recommendations or just want to connect, that's a good place to do it as well. And then my daughter, Julia, Julia Chic XO on Instagram, she wanted me to, to plug her blog because <laughs> she's, she's amazing. So What does she blog about? Fashion and travel and food. And um, so she does a, you, her YouTube channel is incredible. She does her own editing. Um, she wants to, I, I want to help her with the business of in producing makeup and things like that. So spell it again, Julia. Julia, J U L I, chic, C H I C X O. Julia, chic, X O. Okay. On YouTube and Instagram. You guys make chocolates together too. We do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we, we make thousands and thousands of pieces of homemade chocolate and she makes a lot of money. <laughs> and, and I spend three days of my time. <laughs> so let's end with your kind of testimony yeah. of where you are now in your life and, you know, what, what words of wisdom or perspective. There are a lot of people listening, some who still believe, some who are in a faith crisis, some who have left. What's some parting wisdom, just some summary statements you want to make of kind of where you are now in your life and what, what wisdom you'd want to share? Um, so where we are, you know, it's interesting because I, I probably... If I had to label myself, I'm probably a hopeful agnostic. Like, I, I, I would love for there to be an afterlife, but if there's not, I'm not going to know any different when I die. Um, if there is, I will try to live the best life I can, helping as many people as I can, and hopefully that's good enough. Um, I, for our family, 
it's you know this crisis has brought our family together in ways that that we could have never thought about or realized uh, before we went through this process and so it's been overall good for the health of your family members absolutely yeah yeah absolutely and for the connections in your family yes yeah it's been tough in ways but it's been overall better and we wouldn't change a thing um you wouldn't go back in the box no if you have the simplicity but the compartmentalization and the distance you wouldn't do it i wouldn't do it why not because it's just too hard. It it creates too much distance um, within with the connection between Molly and I. It, distance between kids. Um, distance between friends. I don't even. I, I I had good friends within the church, but now I've got amazing friends outside of the church. Better friendships. Better friendships. More real deep. friendships. We can actually talk about stuff that matters. We talk about real problems and real issues. Um, we connect on a level that we've never connected before. And so I, I just think in Mormonism, it's very hard to do that. Everybody has to put on a pretty face. Everybody has to, I mean, there's a reason that, that, that Utah has the number one plastic surgery per capita, right? You have to, or opiate use, or opiate opiate use addict, exactly. You, know. you have to put on this amazing, beautiful face and your kids have to be perfect for church and, you know, make sure you get that Instagram picture of your kids before you, you know, in front of the garage, before you head to church and everybody looks perfect and happy and inside they're dying. And what I want to do is, is show love to everybody. We want to be real. We want to be compassionate to everybody. It doesn't matter what they believe, who they are. We want to have love and compassion. Um, and we want to experience life. Like, if this is all we have, we need to take advantage of as much as we can. That's why Molly and I try to travel so much. We want these experiences. We want, we want to live life to, the, to its fullest. We just have to because we, don't, we aren't guaranteed for what's coming up. And if it is, hopefully I've lived a good enough life with Christian values that, uh, that, that helps me out. So it kind of sounds like you're saying, eat, drink, and marry, eat, drink, and marry <laughs> for tomorrow we die. Is that what you're saying? Love, <laughs> show compassion, eat, drink, and be merry. I think all of that encompasses. Then that's, that's Christianity, right? Christ I mean, really is. That's Christianity. It's show love to everyone. Love one another. Love your neighbor. Love yourself. Love God. So if, if, and, and so if we're doing all of that and Jesus drank wine and we're enjoying good food and wine and we're making connections of, with real people uh, by doing that, I think that's Christianity. So I think I'm doing okay. I love it. Well, Jeremy Young, thank you for coming on Mormon Stories and being willing to share your lovely story. And thanks for your friendship and support over the years. You and Molly are dear to me and Margie, your kids and... We love you guys. Thank you. We love you too. Yeah. So thanks for sharing your story. Thank you so much for having me. All right. All right, everyone. You heard it. This is the story of Jeremy Young. Thanks for tuning in. It's been great. I um, want to thank everyone who uh, supports the Open Stories Foundation and Mormon Stories to make this possible. If you are a donor, thank you. Uh, you made this possible. The staff, the equipment, the technology, the software, the expenses, uh, overhead, all that stuff you've made it possible. If you don't, if you want to see this type of programming continue, if you enjoy this work that we do, please donate. Uh, go up to mormonstories.org, click on the donate button. Um, and 10 bucks a month, $50 a month, $100 a month, one-time donations, whatever you can afford. We're transparent in our finances. It's all tax deductible in the US and it goes towards our mission of providing resources, community and support for people experiencing a religious transition. Thanks for your support. Please do donate and support us. It makes a huge difference. If you want to support our billboard campaign, we'd love to put up billboards all over uh, the Bible, the Book of Mormon belt. Um, you can go to mormonstories.org slash billboard and uh, you can donate to our Salt Lake campaign or you can designate other campaigns that you want to try and help jumpstart. Um, as little as a thousand bucks a month gets a billboard possibly in your area. Um, and we just love the support. We'd love to keep that going for as long as we can. Um, if you need support in a faith crisis and a transition in your marriage, um, you can go to uh, mormonstories.org slash events. And uh, there are all sorts of events coming up where we're supporting people in faith crisis. These events are rated consistently 4.9 out of 5. They've saved marriages. They've saved lives. And they're fun. And we karaoke and they're a blast. And some people drink wine. Others don't. <laughs> um, but they're really fun. And uh, we hope you'll come. They're safe for believers. We, we have people bring mixed faith marriages all the time to these events. And uh, Jeremy even sponsored one of these events in his home in Gilbert, Arizona. 
and they change lives and they save marriages and believers feel safe, which is really important. Uh, so um, if you want us to schedule a workshop or retreat um, in your area, you just have to reach out to staff at openstoriesfoundation.org and you can tell us where you want to bring a workshop or retreat and we'll bring it to you. Again, mormonstories.org slash events for that as well. So thanks to uh, Tim Corey for producing today's episode along with uh, Cody Layton who does the post-production. Uh, thanks to the Open Stories Foundation staff and to the board of directors that make all this possible. We love you guys. We've got over 100 cool episodes lined up that are fabulous. So uh, stay tuned for more stuff. Go to mormonstories.org to comment. Yeah, check us out on YouTube, on Instagram, on Twitter. Uh, share this. Please like the Mormon Stories Facebook page. Please give us a five-star review. That helps. Please give us a review on, on iTunes. Positive reviews on iTunes make a big deal um, as well. Please share this stuff with others. And uh, give us your feedback at mormonstories at gmail.com. If there's any questions or comments or ideas you have, we'd love to have it. That's it, everybody. Thanks again, Jeremy. And we'll tune in again soon uh, for another episode. Take care.